Welcome to this setup workshop. I just want to, you know, share some of the things that I've learned over the years because it seems like there's some interest. So we're going to start off with, uh, you know, some concepts and a lot of test driving, coming back, adjusting the car, and testing again, see how we feel. And there's a couple of reasons why I chose this track and this car. So first of all, it's everybody has this car and everybody has this track. For what we're trying to learn today, which is how roll resistance affects handling, it's basically mechanical grip, so we don't want a lot of aero, which this car suits. This car has all the adjustments necessary for all the things that we want to play with today. And also the adjustments are quite noticeable, where, you know, something like a Miata, where you make the changes, it's, it's very subtle and sometimes it's hard to feel depending on the driver. And for this track, there are lots of corners. It's a large enough track. And a lot of these corners are long and slow corners. Again, so not a lot of aero. There's a lot of time to get into that steady state handling, which is what we're, we're going to be learning about today. The track is mostly flat and uh, camber is pretty low, about three and a half to four degrees. When you're out there, when we're testing the car later, a couple things to keep in mind. A lot of this that we try out today can be done in your real life car or your race car. This car is not fun or easy to drive. It's very easy to try to drive around the shortcomings of this car. And so when you go out there after you make a change, try not to. Try to drive it the same way after each setup and see how the car responds differently. So you're trying to learn and listen to how the car is um, responding. So we're going to first talk about lateral load transfer, which is what happens when we corner. There are only three things that determine lateral load transfer. One is the lateral force, two is how high the center of gravity is, and three, the width of the track. Those are the only three things that determine how much lateral load transfer there is. And so keep in mind, things like roll resistance, like stiffness of your suspension, does not factor into how much weight gets transferred from left to right during cornering. How it works is when there's lateral force, it creates a roll moment because it's pushing on that center of gravity on top of the ground. As you've experienced it in real life cars, you gain load on one side and you lose load on the other. With more load, you get more grip and with less load and you get less grip. All right, so one tire will have more grip than the other. But now lateral load transfer is actually a quote unquote, a bad thing. And why is it bad? Grip on a tire is not linear to load. So when you get more and more load, more and more weight on the wheel, the amount of grip that increases actually gets less and less. So when you have lateral load transfer, it means that the grip that you gain is actually less than the grip that you lose. So on the high load tire, the grip that is gained there is less than the grip that you lose on the low grip tire. So overall, the car loses grip. The next thing that we talk about is lateral load transfer distribution. Only three things determine how much load gets transferred. But when there's more load transfer, there is less grip. So now if you think about what if one axle of the car has more load transfer than the other, then you can affect the relative grip of each axle. So if you imagine on one of these axles, you have a very stiff spring. So when the load goes onto it, the spring pushes back with a lot of force and that force goes into the ground. So this side with a stiffer spring will have more lateral load transfer than the other side. So in other words, this axle with a stiffer spring will have less grip than the axle with a softer spring. So as you can see, anything that affects the roll resistance of the car will affect the handling of the car. So the four things we'll explore today are anti-roll bars, springs, ride height, and tire pressures. All these things change the amount of roll resistance that's in the car. Some of you might have tested the car already and, and some might have not. So I've allotted seven minutes for you to try the car out for those that haven't in the current state, which um, you want to go into garage, if you can see my screen, and go into iRacing setup. Uh, and load this baseline setup and then press done and uh, just drive around a bit and see how the car feels okay I don't hear cars so I presume everybody's in pit lane so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, make some anti-roll bar changes and then see how that feels so maybe I could get some feedback from you guys how how does the car feel so far <laughs> 
horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and and horrible in what sense? Doesn't like to uh, turn in very much. So, Anything else? Yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm just yeah. So one of the things that will recur when looking at setup is that um, from a driving perspective, you really have to pinpoint what is wrong with the car in order to fix it. So for example, the driver may say the car understeers, but that's really not much information, right? Because you really need to start to think about, well, where does it understeer? Is it turn in? Is it mid corner? Is it exit? Um, what am I doing when it understeers? Am I on the brakes? Am I turning the wheel? Am I on the throttle? Or is it going uphill? Is it going downhill? Which corner is it? Like, is it high speed? Is it low speed? So each piece of information put together allows you to pinpoint exactly what you need to change in the setup. You know, in the beginning, it's, it's, what's important is to identify, yes, is the car understeering? Is it oversteering? What's it doing? But keep in mind that as you go further into this journey, you kind of really want to pinpoint what the problem is. So I'm, I'm hearing the car pushes a little bit and, and doesn't like to turn. So if you can see my screen, I've gone into the garage tab and you want to go into chassis. You guys can just follow along here, chassis. And what we're going to do here is when you put your cursor over ARB arms, which stand for uh, anti-roll bar arms, on any of these changes on the bottom of the screen, you'll see that it tells you what the settings mean. So what we're going to do here is we're going to soften the front and stiffen the rear, right? So the softer end will have more grip than the stiffer end. So to soften the front, we're going to click the front ARB arms to eight. Okay, and we're going to scroll down the scroll bar to the bottom, to the rear ARB arms, to zero. Okay, and then we're going to hit apply, and it should say passed. means it passed um, tech inspection. And just hit done. Um, go out again and try the car for another 5-10 minutes. And remember, pay attention when you're trying to slowly get the car to the limit, how the car behaves and how that's different from before. So how was it? Well, a lot more throttle oversteer. A lot more throttle oversteer. Anyone else? I would agree. I yeah? would agree with that. O overall, the car is faster, but the back end comes around a lot. Um, a lot more than before? It feels like it to me. So, had you done the same inputs, would the back end have come around with the before we made the setup change? No. We're kind of starting to see how when we change the roll stiffness, how that weight transfer dynamic moves and changes the handling of the car. So, we're going to go back into the garage and we're going to keep trying different setups. So, as you remember from the list, uh, the second thing from the list that affects uh, roll resistance is spring rates. So what we're going to do here is we're going to change the front spring rate, as you can, if you can see my screen share, the front spring rate to the lowest possible. The bottom should be 105 newtons per millimeter. Uh, and we're going to do this for both sides. But you'll, re you'll notice that as you change these numbers, your ride height has changed. And that's because when you change the springs in a car, if you don't change the weight or the mounting positions, your spring is going to compress less with a stiffer spring or compress more with a softer spring in our case. So the ride height has dropped below minimum. So that's why you see that here on the right side, tech inspection has failed and you need to move the ride height back above the minimum level. So originally it was at 70 millimeters. So you need to go to the spring perch and you just need to change it so that both sides are back up to 70. Oh! Anybody following so far? Yeah. What was the spring perch we were going to set? <laughs> it should yeah. be to 117. What that number is, it doesn't really matter. What's important mm. is you're moving the ride uh, height uh, back to what it is originally, which is 70 millimeters. Okay. You can actually well, change it to metric um, in, in the yeah, garage right window. Yeah, okay. So uh, for okay. the time being, just change it to metric so you can follow along. Because what these numbers right, are right. is is not that relevant right now. What, what you're just trying to understand is 
what does going stiffer do? What does going softer do? Um, if you change your spring rates to be softer, how does it affect your other settings? What do you have to quote unquote fix as we have with the ride height? Uh, mm. The spring rate on the rear, we're going to the stiffest, which is already yeah, the, the case. So, yeah. Six. So you don't need to touch that. The front is 105 on the oh, spring rate. Right. Okay. And the ride height should be around 70. Oh, so you just have to adjust the perch offset just upwards and see when it stops flashing? Correct, because it doesn't okay. matter what the spring perch is on. All you care about is where the ride height is. Everybody good? Uh, just one question, Nikki. Yep. Um, why does the right front still flash yellow when the left front? I right think front? it's it's because it's like 69 point, like there are decimal points beyond what it's showing us that it's okay. registering as closer to the minimum limit. So when it's yellow, it means it's close to uh, um, the boundaries. When it's red, it's okay. it's past the boundary. I see. Okay. In this case, as you can see, or if you can see my screen where I'm clicking the spring perch, it every other click doesn't change the number. So it's it's working in the decimal range that it's not showing. And part of why one side is flashing and the other isn't. So if you look at the corner weights, it's actually not purely symmetric. So if you can see front right, right corner weight is actually about six newtons um, so less than a kilo heavier so that's why it's it's actually sitting a bit lower yeah makes sense okay cool uh, what we've done here is we've softened the front and left the rear unchanged so again softening the front does what it reduces understeer softening the front reduces understeer because it reduces the load transfer in the front, right? So remember, less load transfer, more grip. So try this setup out. Go maybe test drive for another five, seven minutes and see how the car feels. So uh, how did everybody feel about the car? It felt like it was more responsive to trail braking. Okay. And when you say more responsive, as in? Better turn in okay. when trail braking. Okay. Anyone else? I think the back end is still a little stiff. It still wants to come around. Uh, based on our last setup change, it would have uh, want to come around more because we're actually putting more oversteer into the car, and which is you know yep. lines up with what Anchor was saying about how it's a bit more responsive. Meaning, with the trail braking, it rotates and turns in a little bit better because we've put more of the load transfer. Uh, onto the rear axle from the front axle, right? So there's a uh, proportionately there's more grip in the front than the rear than the previous setup So we're gonna continue on this path Anybody remember the third thing that we could adjust to change roll resistance? But ride height will actually subtly change your roll resistance and the reason being is that when you change the ride height you change the roll center and depending on how high your roll center is, um, some of that load transfer will go through the suspension. The rest of the load transfer will go through the suspension linkages, which means it one, it won't compress your suspension, and two, your suspension linkages are much, much, much stiffer than your springs. So when you have more load transfer going through your suspension linkages, your roll resistance is going to be higher right and if we want to get into a little bit more detail for you know the nerdy type like me out there that if your roll center is at ground level then that means no there is zero load transfer going through the linkages meaning all of it is going through your suspension so we're going to play with this um, I think the front end is at the lowest already so what we're going to do is we're going to raise the rear ride height and let me see how far I can go with this. Oh, not very far. So what I want you to do is try and raise the rear ride height to as high as you can without it failing tech inspection. 
So now our front ride height should be about 70. Our rear ride height should be about 101. I have 101 exact. So what you'll notice is that when you change your ride height, just like in your real car, um, your camber will change and your toe will change. So if you didn't notice before in the base setup, your rear camber was negative 2.7. So we need to change it back to negative 2.7 and the rear toe right on the bottom was plus 0 0.4 millimeters so the rear ride height should be about 101 um rear camber negative 2.7 and rear toe plus 0 0.4 and we'll cover alignment in a, probably another session but um, those are the settings that you should be ending up with right now let's go test drive the car So, how did everybody feel about that setup change? Like, you get a little more sensitivity, you can, you know, steer the car with the, with the, the gas a little easier. Mm-hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, I guess it's it's not quite as eager to step out at the back. It's interesting that some of the points you guys touched on, because every setup change we make, has other things that it affects. So for example, if you change the anti-roll bar, it affects suspension independence, right? Because now you're linking two wheels together, the left and the right wheel. So if you go over a bump on one wheel, it's gonna now affect the other wheel, where if you have a softer bar, it doesn't. So if you change springs, it's not gonna have that problem. But what happens is if you change springs, then it'll affect heave, which is how um, when the entire car compresses or lifts, or things like pitch, you know, whether it dives forward or squats backwards, right? Where anti-roll bar doesn't affect these things. So you can kind of see it's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle to have to think about what you want to change and what you don't want to change to achieve the desired effect that you want. But when you raise the ride height, is that it raises the roll center, which if you recall, puts more of the load transfer into the suspension linkages. And which means if it goes through the suspension linkage, it's not going through the suspension, not the springs and dampers, which means the weight transfer is not only more, but also a lot faster, right? So with stiffer suspension or stiffer roll resistance, you're getting a more responsive car, right? Because it sets a lot quicker. So what you're really noticing is that the rear is responding a lot quicker to your inputs. Any, any questions on that? Any comments? It's almost with those few adjustments like a different car. It was undrivable at first, really terrible. And now, I, I wouldn't say it's my favorite, but it is. Yeah, and it's a lot more um, enjoyable to drive, right? I think a lot of the parts of setup is making the car drive it in a way that one, you're comfortable with, and two, that you enjoy driving, right? So, you know, people talk about, oh, you don't need to worry about setup until you're within one second of an alien. And I, I tend to disagree because you want to set the car up so that you can drive a 45 minute race uh, without crashing out or spinning or anything like that, right? So the last setting we're going to change is the tire pressure. Kind of, if you think about it, when you put more air in a tire, the tire becomes more bouncy, right? And it's bouncy because the sidewalls are stiffer because of all the air and the air pressure inside. So, but as I mentioned earlier, whenever you change one aspect of the car, other things change too. So when you change something like a tire pressure, your contact patch size and shape will change. And that may or may not be what you want. But as an experiment, because we're testing these things out, what I want you to do is go to the garage and on the tire section on the left rear and right rear tires change the tire pressure to as high as possible again what the number is doesn't really matter but as long as you go to the as high as pressure as possible failing tech though yep and why right too high. high too high yeah yep why is it higher now <laughs> tires are more inflated. Yep, yeah. tires are more inflated. So just like springs, for the same amount of weight you have on the car, load on the tire or the wheel, um, you know, it's not compressing as much, right? So we've got to go back to the spring perch, 
and drop it into spec. All right? But keep it as high as you can have it, which means it should be around 101. Everybody got it? Not. Yep. All right. Test the car out. <laughs> so, how did that feel? <laughs> Fun. <laughs> yeah, just massive uh, uh, oversteer. I guess. Massive oversteer. Right, that sounds pretty unanimous, right? Everybody kind of agrees? Yeah. Yeah. You know, as I kind of described earlier, whenever you make one change, you're actually changing multiple things. So as we can see here, what we've really changed is at least two things, right? One is the spring rate of the tire, which we've increased the rear, so there's more load transfer in the rear, hence less grip. But what we've also done is that we've changed the contact patch size on that tire. So meaning that as you put more pressure into the tire, the contact patch gets smaller. And which isn't really what you want. You want a large contact patch because the load is more evenly distributed on a larger surface or relatively more evenly distributed, but definitely on a larger surface, which tires like. So. Um, that's the last and final of our setup changes today. Are there any questions that have been lingering so far? If we're tuning a car, you know, understeer, mm -hmm. understeer, what, do we do it in the order that you've done it? No. So, um, it's a good question. And, and this is how you need to think about it. Remember in the beginning when I described, you know, a car understeers, a car oversteers, but that's not enough information. You need to figure out when it's doing it, why it's doing it. So this is where it comes into play when it describes what you want to change and what you don't. So if we ignore aero completely, for example, in the simplistic case, you can change your anti-roll bars or your springs. So which one do you do? Now, the understanding is that the anti-roll bars reduce the wheel independence. So in a bumpy track, you might not want that. Right, and you might go for the springs instead. But what springs will do is that it will, for example, change your pitch resistance. Right, so it might, you know, the, if you soften one end of the suspension on the springs, you know, it might dive a bit deeper or it might squat a bit more. When that happens, it might change your wheel alignment because as the wheel goes through the suspension travel, the alignment changes. Right, your toe, you get bump steer. Uh, with camber, you get camber gain or loss. So in light of that question, I'm just going to quickly run through what some of these setup changes can do. So if we take a look at anti-roll bars, it changes the elastic roll resistance. Elastic just means, in, in the vehicle dynamics case, um, the load transfer that goes through the suspension, like goes through the shocks and, and springs. Right, it affects responsiveness because again, stiffer typically means um, more responsive as it sets quicker. Um, as I mentioned earlier, suspension gains or loses independence depending if you soften uh, or stiffen the anti roll bar. It will change the suspension travel in roll. So, if you have a stiffer anti roll bars, the car will overall roll less. Um, if it's softened, it will roll more. And when it rolls more, it means it will go through a larger suspension travel range. And so you will have, if you have bump steer, you will have more bump steer uh, at the end of the range. If you have more camber gain, if you have camber gain, you will get more camber gain in the, um, in the end of the range. And it can also have aero implications. Now the next one for spring rates, um, again, because you know it's a part of the suspension, it changes the elastic roll resistance of that axle. Um, so similar to uh, anti-roll bars, it affects responsiveness because it changes the stiffness. Like I mentioned before, it changes the pitch and heave resistance, right? Um, and so that will have aero implications as well. Um, and again, just like uh, the anti-roll bars, it will change your suspension travel. But unlike the anti-roll bars, it will change your suspension travel in roll, in pitch, in heave, um, and in jounce. Jounce is just your individual wheel um, up and down. So the third one that we went through is ride height. It alters the roll center. So again, the higher the roll center, 
the more of that load transfer goes through the suspension linkages, which is very, very stiff compared to your suspension, right? So it affects the amount of load transfer that goes through the suspension. Um, again, because it's stiffer, it will affect the dynamic response. As some have mentioned that with a higher rear ride height, the car seems to be more responsive and turn in a bit better and, and more responsive to you know throttle inputs. Because ride height will change the rake and overall ride height of the car, it'll affect aero as well. Um, and it will change where that camber curve and bump steer window is. Because now if you move your suspension up, let's say one centimeter, um, you're at a different bump steer range. Um, and it will also affect jacking forces. Jacking forces is beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but basically it's uh, when you corner, what happens is that if you have a roll center above the ground, it will actually jack the car up. Where if you have the roll center below ground, it will squat the car down. And finally, the last one, tire pressure. It changes the spring rate of the car as we discussed. You know, we talked about earlier, if there's an order to do things, generally no, but tire pre tires is probably the last thing you want to touch because you always want to maintain the ideal contact patch, uh, which is a large contact patch, very even in weight and ideally wide. So when you change from the ideal contact patch, not only are you adjusting the spring rate, but you're also losing grip because of that. So again, um, changing the tire pressures will also affect wear because you have a smaller contact patch so it's going to wear more on that small patch and it'll affect heat, right? Because again, smaller contact patch, it heats up quicker and it dissipates slower. So under what circumstance would you, you know, deviate from the ideal contact patch to change tire pressure? So one would be, well, you've changed everything else and the car still is way over steering or way under steering you might want to have to change the tire pressure to fix that. Or over a um, you know, medium or long stint, one set of tires just overheats way too much. And you've tried other suspension adjustments to bring the heat down, but you can't. So you know, your last resort is to change the tire pressure to the heat that you want. Um, that's mostly what I've learned in terms of how roll resistance affects handling. If there are no more questions, um, you know, enjoy the rest of the session. Thanks for uh, coming.